It is from our families we first know about love and caring. Bye-bye, Daddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Nicholas. It is through them that we are taught the values of learning and sharing. Early on, we realize there are faces of another kind besides our own. We learn to say their names and try to mimic their sounds. We admire them for their fur. We love them for their beauty. We adore them for their apparent sweetness. We are tickled by their antics. We are taken by their ferocity, their delicacy, their complexity. We are in awe of their strength. We are struck by how much they can resemble us. But while we are animals too, most of us learn at a young age to separate ourselves in a superior way, often thinking we are more intelligent, more socialized, more deserving of more of the world than are they. And over the last century, the results of this domineering attitude have been devastating. Thousands of plant and animal species have disappeared from the face of the earth forever. Across the globe, expanding human populations have put tremendous pressures on wildlife and their natural habitats. But our compassion alone will not save the world and its wildlife. We must adopt a new attitude that guarantees wildlife will not only survive with us in this world, but thrive. At Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, staff and volunteers are working hard to correct the distorted views that exist and replace them with images of dignity and respect. Their dedication to the animals is unchallenged and though their relationship with them is intimate and their knowledge about them vast, it is still incomplete. In many ways, these individuals know the animals they care for can never be fully understood in human terms because they are very different and unique beings. This program is about these people and the animals they care for. It's a good morning on the savannah. Last night, a baby zebra was born inside the stable. While the male zebra that sired the foal senses something unusual has happened, zookeepers and veterinarians from the animal health department give the new baby a vaccination and an ear tag. This is the seventh zebra born at the zoo, and it's a healthy male. Virtually all the animals that are out here on the savanna are individuals with individual personalities. They may look alike, they may look virtually identical, but we can always tell them apart. Probably the zebras get a lot of questions, and people wonder if the striping pattern is identical from animal to animal. Uh, some people are just convinced that it is, and it's not. It's as individual as fingerprinting. With the usual morning routine somewhat thrown off schedule, the keepers of the savanna get down to the daily business of cleaning and feeding the other animals exhibited there. Zebras in the herd come into the stable for protein-rich grains and some carrots. In the meantime, the zoo gates open and the visitors start to arrive. At the hippo exhibit, keepers are cleaning out the pool, a physically demanding task that must be done three times a week. Once accomplished, the hippos who have spent the night in their stable are served breakfast poolside.
the giraffes, too, having spent the night in their barn, are now ready to join the zebra and springbok on the savanna. Okay, you guys are gonna go out, huh? Let's be good, okay? Hi, Sooks. Okay, come on, you guys. Let's go. Sooks, come on. Yeah, out you go. Out you go. A little farther. People want to know what the giraffe are like as to their personality and how they behave because they have a picture of them being a very peaceful animal and they're always interested in finding out whether that's the case or not. The problem is that they're a very high strung animal and they frighten very easily. Safety is very important in working around exotic animals because um, none of the animals in a zoo really can be considered tame or trained or harmless. You always have to be on your guard, and especially when you get into big animals like a giraffe that weighs a ton. If they just happen to bump into you or, or step on your foot or something like that, again, they didn't mean anything by it, but um, you are seriously injured. The giraffe have a very high protein requirement, and so they need alfalfa hay, a good quality alfalfa, which we test regularly. And they get it hung high up in a tree so that none of the other animals are going to get to eat it. The other animals would like to eat it, but it would be too rich. Improvements in animal nutrition and food preparation is an all-consuming matter to the zookeepers at Woodland Park. With better, more nutritious diets, the animals live longer and reproduce more successfully. It is for the sake of the animal's health that visitors are asked not to feed them. At one time, it was thought that animals could eat anything. If it wasn't good enough for people, well, give it to the animals. And that's not true, because some of them actually have more sensitive digestive systems than people do. This is something that uh, we feel very strongly about, that it's uh, got to be high quality food for the animals, too. And so the food is brought to the zoo in a produce truck that would deliver to a restaurant or to your local grocery store. So over the years, they've, uh, they've refined the diets. What we try to do is feed them as close to their natural diet as we can. And one of the things we do is give them variety, and we also try to give them some occupation, in other words, something to do. Many animals spend their whole day just looking for food and consuming food. So it's important that they have some occupation with the nutrition. Um, we have a variety of animals in the Australasian unit. This is an emu diet. And what I've got is a pellet with grain product. This is a commercially prepared diet. And the, the animals get this free choice. We feed this as much as they want of it. They also get some, some green foods. Um, this is romaine. And the reason we feed this is to help keep them from eating all the green food in the yard, because we have a naturalistic exhibit, and we don't want them to eat all of the leaves off of all the bushes. Another diet for some of the birds is um, a grain product. It's um, alfalfa and grains compressed and then made into a crumble. And this silver stuff that you see is called oyster shell, and that's to provide some calcium in the bird's diet. When birds are laying eggs, they have an increased need for calcium. So we just put it in there, and they know enough to take what they want. Uh, during egg laying season, we'll add a little bit more, but they do get some of that every day. One other thing we feed for occupation is browse. And this is Escalonia. It's a wonderful uh, plant that grows here in, in Seattle. And it's very palatable. It grows year round, which is nice. We can feed it winter as well as summer. And we feed this to the animals. And they'll just take and pick each leaf off, little by little. And when they get down to the woody parts, many of the animals will even eat that. Now, one thing tree kangaroos also need, and this is true with other animals in the zoo, they have special ingredients in their diet to help, for instance, maintain color. Tree kangaroos are red. If you don't feed them a little bit of tea, like about a half a tablespoon of just plain old tea leaves in their diet every day, they turn kind of a pale beige color, and they lose that nice red richness. Virtually all animals in the zoo receive a specialized diet, and food may be placed either right in their exhibits, where they're free to search and choose for themselves, or it can be fed to them by hand. Each evening when we bring in the grills, we do some hand feeding with each animal to feed them separately. One of the main reasons is to assure that each animal gets a minimum 
amount of each type of food so that we, we know for sure that uh, the more dominant animals aren't hogging all the food and everybody gets their fair share and we get good even nutrition among all the animals. It also is very important to socialize them with the individual keepers that they're working with so that they become very used to us and relatively trusting of us. If he eats it now, he'll just hoard it. From the African straw-colored fruit bats that prefer their bananas a bit on the mushy side, to the lions who feast on a whole animal carcass once a week to help stimulate their natural behavior, To the elephants, who are fed melons following their midday baths, the preoccupation with providing the best possible nutrition continues. The red pandas are probably our most important um, browse problem at this point. Red pandas live on a diet of bamboo. It's only been in the last three years or so that we've been trying to plant a lot of bamboo, um, primarily to have a a huge supply for them to have a constant daily supply of it, but also um, in anticipation of our future tropical forest planting and landscaping needs. Come on, Obi. Come on. That's a good girl. Come on out, Blue. Come on, Blue. Zookeepers and Here. zoo veterinarians know on, which Blue. food is the irresistible Blue. favorite of any Here. particular animal and use it as an okay. indicator of that animal's health. Okay, Blue. Exotic animals in the wild, if they're not feeling well, um, they don't slow down. If they slow down or acted strange, the rest of the group would leave them behind. And then they'd be vulnerable to be preyed upon. And they bring that same adaptation to captivity. So it's extremely difficult to recognize when an animal is ill because they work, they look perfectly fine. Being a zookeeper, working with animals 24 hours around the clock, every day of the year, in all kinds of weather, is demanding. Zoo professionals take their responsibilities very seriously. And when an animal does get sick, or doesn't act in a normal way with the other animals, there may be no tried and true method of resolving the problem. Answers aren't always readily available because the research hasn't been conducted yet anywhere in the world. Sometimes a zookeeper's instincts about an animal play a vital role in its care. Most people don't realize it, but it's one of the most emotionally stressful jobs I think you can have is right in there with types of social work, police work, and this type of thing because we're dealing with a living entity. And whenever there's disagreement on what we want to do with an animal, it causes a great deal of stress among us because everyone thinks that we're, we're going to harm this, you know, whatever course of action we've chosen is harmful. So coming to agreement and dealing with each other and the emotions, our own emotions and each other's emotions, is probably the toughest part of it. I'm working on a project with some baby birds that needed some continuity, a great deal of continuity and a lot of time. Uh, at least six hours a day just dedicated to them. And in the early stages, we didn't have any norms to go by, so we were sort of writing the books. And it's been hard. It's been hard on me. It's been hard on my family. And I've just been here a lot. That's the basic reality of zookeeping. It's not as glamorous as you think. It's long, hard hours. So what is it about keeping a zoo that makes these people and others like them so committed to their work? For some, it's the animals, to be sure. But for others, the public contact is equally rewarding. As you can see, she has a very reddish colored tail, and that's where she gets her, uh, her name, Red-Tailed Hawk. And as I was saying, she's a, a female. The only difference between males and females in birds of prey is size. And not all birds of prey, but in, in many birds of prey, the, the main difference is in size. She has a name. Her name is Sahali, which is an Indian word that means high above. She can't be released back to the wild because of the fact that she is imprinted and uh, has lost all of her fear of humans. Sometimes I get my boots wet and go right down the middle. Come on. 
Now, this is probably one of the safest kinds of exercises for baby birds because they don't fall and hurt themselves over when they walk over things. Come on, guys. The best thing I like is being able to share what I know with others, being able to educate the public about animals, about conservation. I think that's the best thing I can do is teach somebody. And maybe, maybe I might get lucky enough to do something that might be significant in the world of animal husbandry that might help save some animal somewhere down the line. Conservation concerns and communicating with the public are strong recurring themes at Woodland Park Zoo. Educational classes are offered to students of all ages, and the University of Washington holds its Behavioral Studies of Zoo Animals class at the zoo, collecting data and conducting systematic observational research. There is also great pride in having pioneered naturalistic exhibits that work for both humans and animals alike. We've been putting animals into planted enclosures in order to provide a much more uh, natural and healthy environment for the animals to behave. And this is in an effort to get them to behave in more natural ways. Animals develop in a particular habitat in correlation with the kinds of landscape and climate and rock or topography features. And that's a very important thing for people to learn if they're, if they're interested at all in animals. It's why is an animal the color it is or why is it the size it is? Why does it have run fast or why does it climb trees? And we're trying to show and, and recreate the relationships of plants and animals to the world today. Because what, what human beings have to learn is the fact that our animal species are dwindling in numbers and in sizes, and it's primarily because of the loss of the habitat. The new grill exhibit we have here uh, is significant in several ways. It was pioneering in a couple ways. Uh, one, it's full of natural plantings. The very great strength of that that I see is that when people come and visit and see that, they see a normal social unit behaving much more naturally, foraging for food, having to look for it in a very natural surrounding and the subliminal type of education that comes from that uh, I think is the strongest thing that zoos do when they leave here from now on when they think of gorillas that's what they're going to picture that type of grouping that type of habitat we've already made the connection with habitat and a need for natural habitat for these animals to exist in the wild they sometimes seem to enjoy watching the people as as much as the people enjoy watching them uh, but it's also very important for gorillas to have the option of privacy. Sometimes they get tired of the noise and, and the crowds and um, they really need to be able to remove themselves from exhibit and they do have areas like behind the mound uh, where they can go out of view from the people. Gorillas are just one of several endangered species at Woodland Park Zoo in which breeding has been successful. Zoos have begun working very hard for the last 15 years or so at breeding almost everything we have. The first step of doing that is to, one, stop becoming a consumer of wildlife. We are pretty much self-supporting in most animals. Very few animals come out of the wild anymore. We trade among zoos, we breed, and we supply ourselves. We're self-sustaining. And the second thing is we want to eventually be able to, if the situation arises, supply animals for restocking the wild. Keeping accurate, computerized records on each animal through the data bank of the International Species Inventory System is a time-consuming but very important function at the zoo. Quite simple. It has information on the animals, where it came from, on the sex of the animal, on when it was born, on whether it was well caught, on the ID mechanism. Does it have an ear tag? Does it have a... a a tattoo, what is its stud book number, what is its name, and I can edit all this information and then once a month this program is sent to the international organization and is used to update their database. It takes many caring and knowledgeable people to run a zoo. Professionals and volunteers alike form the backbone of this extended zoo family. Every year, more than a thousand people donate over 60,000 hours of volunteer service to the zoo. And you as a visitor are part of the family portrait too. 
remembering to respect the animals, speaking softly when near them, respecting their need for quiet time and private spaces, being patient and waiting for them to reappear again, learning more about them and their habitats. It has been said that in the end we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. We hope you will come back to Woodland Park Zoo, learn to love the animals, and want to conserve them. As the zoo prepares to close its gates for the night, the routines are starting over once more. Those animals that are housed indoors for the night come inside, and for some animals, the evening hand feedings begin. The animals spend the night in quiet. The keepers finish up their tasks and go home. It is clear that those who work and volunteer here are sustained by the very animals they nurture. With their dedication and yours, Woodland Park Zoo will remain a zoo you can be proud of. A very special place for animals and people alike.